awkward. Now, now we can, we okay. can, we could go on. Okay, so I need to actually go have dinner, but let me just finish nice. this. Yes. Uh, but essentially, okay, just repeating. On a query life cycle, ideally we would have four steps. The first one is just parsing, so doing syntactic validation, semantic validation, and all that for the query language. Mm -hmm. Second is doing the bind, because you're going to bind to real objects that are already present in your database. Mm -hmm. So you basically fetch metadata, you bind things together if you need. So for example, uh, pagination, let's say. Uh, you ideally you would do something related to pagination here, like not the pagination itself. You're still not executing. You're just uh, putting offsets and all the things in place, so you can just go there and fetch it. Then you run in the optimizer, uh, the, which is the query planner, which is gonna generate uh, uh, a new query uh, that returns the same output as the one you provided, but the, but modifying and doing algebra tricks reduce the amount of garbage that you, you get otherwise, you see? Okay, that's the optimization that Mario mentioned earlier then. Yeah, so for example, let me give an example of a query planning. Uh, imagine if you do a left join. Do you agree that if you do a left join, the order matters? Yeah. Uh, so this, this is the sort of thing that you need to pay attention, right? So you would be more restricted to do that. But if it's like an inner join, yeah. uh, all the, like three inner joins, let's say, if you do on the table that is the uh, biggest one first, and it's like all commutative, that's dumb because you're basically yeah. you're wasting uh, your you're, time. Yes, you should do on the least, uh, on the lower set because then you would restrict more before you go to the actual table. Yeah. Right. So uh, this kind of thing you do. Yeah, that's there. actually a little, that's actually clever. I never thought of that. That's true. Yeah, that's uh, that's really dumb, by the way. That's the most basic uh, validation we can do, and I think that's the most we will. Uh, <laughs> and then we have the query execution, which is the step that picks the bytecode that was generated in a previous step. Uh, sorry, it, this step is also not, sorry. I said pick the bytecode. It picks the 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 plan that it gave generates the bytecode, runs it, and gives me the output. What is the benefit of, of transforming it to bytecode? Well, it's just a step-to-step -step execution. That's easier. That's like compiling a language, man. Yeah, but why would we want to compile it? Like... Well, you're not compiling. You're just generating instructions. Like, uh, bytecode is just a fancy way no, to no, say no, no. step-by-step understand... procedure. Wait, so are you saying that we're going to have to create another, like, intermediary language before no, going no, to... No, 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 no. Man, instructions. Literally, this, like, a, it's literally a black box that you issue commands saying, get this table. Oh, now split this table from offset X to offset X. And this set of X instructions is what you're calling virtual machine? Yes. Okay. Uh, virtual machine... That is, is a language, uh, Makita, by the way. Uh, yes, it is, <laughs> but... It's not as scary as like uh, you see. Uh, yeah, assembly. It's, we're not gonna make. We actually could do a plugin in Silverware to do that. That's we what, could. <laughs> that would be cursed, but okay. We could. Uh, uh, so let me just quickly run over the features before I go have dinner. Okay, go. So, basic binary serialization. I think everybody's already yeah. on par on what it is. Basic. Yeah, and if no, if somebody d d d don't get it. Doesn't get it? You can you can raise your hand or say something, and we're gonna we're gonna explain. Mm -hmm. uh, basic indexing is no more than just doing a three, and that's it. Yeah. <laughs> that's why basic. Uh, persistent storage. That's just writing to a disk in a yeah. binary file, or actually anything goes as long as you persist. Yeah. Uh, a query planner that is just to do the. I mean, this is gonna be fun. Uh, this is a big pick. Uh, the step that I explained: picking the ST and doing the. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, virtual machine is the execution stuff. Uh, relation alterations. This is going to be hard, uh, like uh, changing stuff on disk and adapting the storage. So I'm going to organize in the order we should do Wait, stuff, okay? Wait, repeat the sentence? We're going to do what? Uh, think of this. Imagine if you're storing stuff sequentially in sure. the disk. If you, do, if you remove something in the middle, do you agree that it leaves a gap in there? You're talking about fragmentation? Is that what you're talking about? Fragmentation is a very, but I think you mean what I um, what I think, which is uh, you're leaving gaps in the middle. Yeah, right? that's, that's called vacuum. internal fragmentation. Yeah, that's a vacuum in Postgres. 
That's why they have the oh, PG. Oh, so they vaccine. have different names. Okay. Yeah. Cool. So uh, basically, alteration would be you add a new column. Now all your entities they have an ex uh, an extra size, right? Wait, are we not gonna just rewrite everything from scratch? We're gonna do like removing a block in the middle and then. Okay, let me give an example. You wow. have ten, you have ten terabytes stored in your database, and you want to add a new column. Do you type yes, <laughs> and then you wait for like three days? And three days? That's I, a good I way to put seen... it. That's a good way to put it. Yeah. So, <laughs> man, that that is the problem that I say. Like when I complain so much of people mixing logical and physical representation, it's because of this. Oh yeah. This is a physical constraint. It has nothing to do with the logical part. Because on the logical part, it's still just one relation, right? It's still yeah. shown there. Yeah. On the physical part, it's all, it's all like over the place in uh, pointers. Yeah. So, for example, when people say, oh, no, you should not use like var sharp without a, ma uh, a max, right? A text. Okay, depends on the... Oh, and then you say, okay, which database? Uh, because it depends, right? It depends on the how the vendor implemented this. Uh, on Postgres, that's totally fine because you basically have the, uh, uh, as far as I know, uh, you have the row, right? Uh, so how does that influence? If you have a higher page, uh, if you have a high uh, a high row size for your pagination, you're, you you'll agree that you're gonna fit less rows inside one page. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's going to be slower because you're going to have to fetch consistent, right? Mm -hmm. um, so you either do very good indexing, but even if you do that, you still have an overhead. On so uh, SQLite is very different on it. Uh, but Postgres is like this. Oh, SQL Server. Oh, it's whatever. Uh, SQL Server is like this. You if you, you can add inside the, the inside the row a column that is like a blob. And then you say, man, I'm screwed because now I have like a potentially two gigabytes <laughs> video in the, the row. So it's going to shatter the pagination, right? Oh, yeah. But that's not true because it basically just has a pointer for a region called blob region, which is where it stores the actual blob. So you see, like, this is just a very dummy example, okay? Mm -hmm. but it just shows that the, the structure that you choose to do things in disk has nothing to do with the logical structure. So don't need to reflect them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think uh, everybody here is aware of that. We we uh, do separate operational semantics yeah. from the notation semantics. It's fine. Yeah, it's most people surprise me. <laughs> uh, yeah. So okay, uh, temporal dimension. Uh, this is a bonus, I guess, but it's pretty fun. Uh, it's to add uh, instead of just it, like one of the practices that I see people doing a lot is that they want to make their databases immutable, so they don't lose information, right? Yeah, you only you never do immutable. updates. You only Sorry, do inserts. Not immutable. Yeah, you just do inserts. Not immutable, right? Yeah. That's immutable. But just uh, not lose information. But temporality is basically to not lose information. Is this uh, the sixth normal form stuff? No, it doesn't need to be. It can be fifth normal form. Ah. Uh, okay. Uh, but basically, like a uh, alter uh, temporal dimension is like varying stuff and it's actually man funny enough it, this is not easy but i know how to do it uh i think the best because i saw i was uh seeing uh, my friend doing a library for pulse with uh so basically it's like this you you add you have some special set operations to handle constraints based on time so for example you need to keep the record of all the things that happened and clean than in the context that you are observing. So, for example, you are adding a new predicate. So, you have a predicate. Uh, what is a predicate? Let's see if you are. Wait, what is a predicate in, in which domain? In a database. In, in a, a database. database? I have no idea. I know in, in logic, logic programming and stuff like that, but... Okay, what is a predicate in logic? It is a statement that is true. Mm, is it? As far as I can tell, that's my understanding on it. I have a, t in a test about this on so Monday. So why do I write, for example, in F# -sharp if I write map dot uh, list dot filter, it will ask for a predicate, which is a function. Why? Yeah, yeah, but that's not logic programming. That's other types of programming. When I when no, I say logic be, programming, you understand prolog, okay? Okay, but that's still not true. 
I, I heard, well, I read that in prologue, when you say that you have a predicate, you have um, a term that will will try to find term will, will, will try to find parameters quote unquote that makes the term truthful that's my understanding so okay that that it that proves something right but it's yeah. not the truth in itself that's a fact yeah that, yeah okay i got it so yeah that makes sense so it, you understand you can understand it as a function that picks something and then gives the true right yeah true yeah yeah blue. that's how i explain to my colleagues like because everybody was confused because of this confusion of ambiguity of you have a predicate in normal quote unquote normal programming and what mm -hmm. when whenever the professor talked about the predicate everybody got confused and then i told them imagine that the predicate is a function that returns a boolean that happens to be true so it needs to be true actually yeah. for it to be a predicate yeah yeah no, no. i agree do but with in, false. i, I false. said that only to help them that's what I said. No, no, I got it, but just uh, an observation. So anyway, it's something that takes variables and gives truth data. Yeah. Uh, so the point of it is the following. Uh, a relation, you're basically trying to enforce a predicate into a table. I don't like saying table because it's not the same thing. But yeah, no, table is bad table. in this case because people will think that we are mixing implementation details again with the whole... Yes. Uh, but the point is, of, of it is that a uh, predicate is basically a statement like uh, people that uh, people that are present that people that have registered in them. Oh, I That's think I exactly. think you actually gave, gave examples of that in your pres database presentation back in the day. Mm -hmm. Oh, that one was pretty bad, man. I should have really <laughs> That was not bad. You did in Emacs. It was pretty, pretty uh, scheduled. Pretty styling, man, most of. But anyway. Uh... Okay, I lost where. No, you about... were talking about the, what is a predicate, and then you're about to say that oh, uh, I registered these folks on the 27th of November, and what something like you were about right. to say something like that. So you have the you have the it's basically the ontology of what it means to have that table into being. So why yeah. that table? Uh, a uh, an invariant would be a, a truth, and the values are the the proofs, right? Which are which are the rows. Yeah. Okay. So these are statements that have been connected via some relation along with each other. Yeah. To represent some truth statement. So yeah. you should only ideally store things that are true in your database. Because yeah, you and this is where we are losing everybody. Everybody that is a fan of news, you can. Yes. You, you are losing you. <laughs> so, okay. Uh, so there is no way in this model to have news to have all the things, right? So I'm keeping all those. But anyway, like the uh, the temporal dimension is basically the same but adding time so i thought this was true at this time yeah. so if you go back in time and you say between time ta x and y you can get all the true predicates and yeah. then you should only know that one thing is true at each time that's a constraint yeah that's what i mean so this is the kind of thing that you do and uh, you have other uh, uh contenders to do it by the way uh, event sourcing is one of them uh, <laughs> Uh, okay, user-defined functions and user-defined procedures. Uh, that's pretty straightforward. Uh, yeah. Heaps, that's one extra way to do the indexing. Uh, where I don't think I should go on that, but that's like very far when we have stuff done. Sure. Uh, we are going to, well, to be fair, to some extent we're going to have to do but not what I, maybe, I mean, I wish I, I can't edit. So I just typed heaps here, but I... I it's actually something else. But when, anyway. you, when you arrive back, you can explain heaps. Yeah, yeah, just ignore this. Uh, compression. Yeah, I was, uh, I was thinking about that. I was thinking about that. So what do you mean about compression? Do you mean compression of the data itself, or are we going to compress tables and entities? Uh, we, uh, I mean, I'm, I thought of more just the option to compress things, but I specifically... Because, because if you think about it, do... like, I thought about something really cool, really, really cool. Okay. We could ask Racket to download... DRN's Huffman compressor because it's implemented in Rust, right? So mm. we, we could ask Racket to go there, download the GitHub, 
compile with Nix and then generate a compressor. In, and then every single time you're going to persist text data, mm -hmm. you apply the compressor to, to, to get the complex data. That would be really cool. This is cool, but this is more of a bonus as well. Yeah. Uh, I think compressor goes particularly well on the schema as well. Yeah, I don't know. We're going to have to discover an algorithm that is great to, yeah, to compress stuff like that. This is like a bonus, man. Like, uh, this is not like impacting how it works. It's just impacting how it performs. Right? So yeah, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's okay. Uh, so I put constraints because, well, this is necessary to be actual additional. Uh, and unicity, uh, key constraints and checks, and and one thing that most BMSs lack, invariance, which is like uh, given all the conditions that you have expressed in your code, are they all true and uh, 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 persist in the current uh, mode? Uh, that's for that's you can do that with temporal or not, uh, but it's basically just a way to say. That all the the data that you that you have right now they are not ambiguous, uh, in the terms of not nulls. Basically that. Mm -hmm. uh, by the way, this is very cool. Uh, I can show, I can present something. Uh, user defined triggers and system defined triggers. Where the, which topic cool. is containing cascading? By the way, is that recursion? So cascading is recursion, but it's also it's diluted. Uh, it's recursion. But it's also a uh, query planning. Ah. Because, Wait, uh, if what? cascading is query planning? This is not a, yeah. an optimization per se. This is kind of like maintaining the truth of the database. Just, uh, query planning is not query optimization. That's ah, one. That's one use case. Yes. Query optimization is one thing inside query planning. Query planning is like this. You're basically uh, predicting the work that you should perform, but you're still not performing it. So. If you do some bullshit, uh, you just halt there. You see? Ah, okay. So okay, that's a the important difference. Uh, it, it's uh, it's between the bind and the optimize in the fourth script cycle that I mm -hmm. said. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, rec recursion. Uh, it has also queries on um, recursion, by the way, and triggers. Uh, remember the queries uh, for triggers. We're gonna have to do a graph, by the way. That's gonna be. Cool. Yeah, another uh, tree. <laughs> Uh, not really. It doesn't need to be a tree. Uh, oh, wait. It does have to be a tree for you to uh, ensure that it halts. Right? So, yeah. Yeah. yeah because, uh, or you can make a graph that doesn't have cycles, I guess. Views, which are more interesting than they seem, by the way. Uh, partition data. I don't think I'll go on this right now, but it's basically uh, doing vertical and horizontal partitioning. Uh, I can go on that later. Uh, let's ignore that now. Locks? Locks right. To write and like having more icon. Having what? Uh, we and lost your audio? Cycle. Yeah, sorry, what? No, you said locks and then uh, your audio cut. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Uh, locks and then locks basically are for concurrency, right? So to forbid. Oh, this is a semaphore people. and stuff yeah, like that. Yeah, yeah, semaphore. Um, Okay, you so basically, to... this project, if you do a database for real, you actually do need to pay attention to a computer science degree. Okay. Man, you do. Yes, you <laughs> do. You have all of the graphs, <laughs> everything. Is uh, recovery. So this is going to be interesting because I don't know how to do it. Uh, I, c I know where to read, but I never are you, is reco are you When you say recovery, are you talking about backtracking, like going back in time? Yes. Uh, you know the, the wall file on Postgres? Um, not in specific, but why should would that be hard? Isn't it just as the sake of not doing garbage collection on previous data and saving that somewhere else? Uh, depends. I, I mean, uh, here's the thing. There's this called write-ahead log, right? Which is the... If it commits to here, it Postgres ensures to you that it will write. So you need some intermediary persistent storage to ensure that we will, you will perform. Let's say that you wrote to the write-ahead file, uh, but then you, you died, right? Power went out. Yeah, okay. And then you reboot, and then uh, you pick it up, but it's on the wall file. You need to know how to data and modify it, right? That sure. seems pretty straightforward, but what do you do when you commit, like, 
thousands of millions of lines to write, for example. Where do you store that? Do you store that fast? Like, you need to ensure that you stored all of them. You see? Hey, and you can so die in the middle of the process. You can die in the middle. So, the point is you, you can't do... That's hard. Like, that's not easy. Because you need... I, I know I know where to read, though. That's, that's fine. Uh, but we need to allow recovery. So, this is basically a um, commit, I would say. Like, the, uh, I imagine that the uh, most oh, grug way of testing that is like uh, uh, you open the server and I open the client in my machine and then I press enter trying to write a thousand lines and then I push, I, I, I pull the plug in off my computer just for I forgot just about for... transactions, by the way. Yeah, and there's transactions. Which I had to re implement in my work, by the way. Uh, that's cool. No, that's not cool. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I could have yeah, just I know, used, but anyway. <laughs> I could have just used end plan caching, which is. Uh, this is, again, one bonus, but this is important for performance because if you run multiple queries, uh, ideally you would cache plans and paths that you know that are faster for your particular schema. So you don't have to redo them all the time and your query just runs faster. So wow. good. I have no idea on what is the criteria there. How do you know to resort the oh, queries? Oh, there is a thing called statistics. Uh, that you can. <laughs> no, I'm not joking. There, there is a feature called statistics that you generate. Uh, you generate statistics about the uh, execution based on previous executions. So but you how can do you know? But if, what if the query is completely different than the previous yeah. execution? Well, you know the pieces of it are not. So, for example, if you're doing a select star on a specific table, okay, that's terrible, but. You're doing it anyway, and then you know the based performance on that. On the past, given this data. And then with a derivative or things like this, you can predict more or less accurately uh, what, you, what you're going to end wild. up. That's wild. The fact that that works is wild. Uh, but think of this. If you do something that uses a select star, like for example in a where clause, you do a nested query, let's say then you, s you have a component in there that you know that takes about this time, right? Yeah. So now what you have to do is you don't have to recalculate the component that you already have stored plus, uh, you just do a plus what you have stored plus the component that you're calculating now, the current query. I think I got it. I'm not sure, but I think I understand the, the whole... You use statistics to predict yeah, basically, this stuff. This is math, man. Like, this might be very... Very boring, but this might be cool. Uh, I can, I can, some. No, if, Man, you're well, gonna have, well, if you're gonna have to model the thing as a derivative, of course it's gonna be cool. There's no doubt about it. Well, implementing it, maybe not. <laughs> That's the problem. <laughs> uh, oh, I forgot. Uh, I think it was included. Uh, uh, it's called a cardinality, by the way. Uh, cardinality. So, drawings and all that stuff. <sighs> okay, go go have dinner. Oh yeah, I'll go back. So anyway, I'm gonna I'll talk to Marin and Manatan about mm -hmm. issues that we can create in the meantime. Okay, I'll be right back. <clears throat> so, uh, who has the the, uh, the first idea to create a, f a new issue? Uh, we could look at the the. We could try to look for a formatter for for the project. Um, there's one called uh, FMT. You call it from Racco, but I couldn't find any documentation about how to configure it. So that's a problem. Because it would be nice to have um, it would be nice to add uh, format checking to the CI. Yeah, I that's think okay. It we can do that. Helpful. Um, uh, uh, Marinho, yeah. by configure you mean like starting to use or to customize the thing? Customize. Because if it's the second, oh yeah, then that's a good sign. Yeah. Uh, I know that it's possible to configure it. Uh, I just want to. What, to, is, the, what to... is the name of the, uh, that language though? Uh, Racket? Uh, no. Programming. 
This is a serious project, so probably it, it has some something like that. Do you recognize? Is it is it this? No, this is apparently for scribbing, so this is for docs. They don't have apparently for matter rules. There's that one. Um, I just posted it in chat. It's as I said, it's called FMT. Um, the thing is, it does some weird things when you have um, when you have particularly wide uh, forms, uh, specifically. Uh, for definition forms, usually you want the name of the thing you're defining on the same line as the define keyword, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, sometimes it doesn't do that if you try to run the Racco FMT on the on Racket Towers repo. Oh, you already tested that. Yeah, I was playing around with it uh, yesterday night, uh, among other things. So, yeah, that's one reason why I, I wanted to see how to configure it, just because the defaults are a bit weird, as I said. Um, yeah, that's... That, uh, I think we, if we're gonna allow... Well, if you're gonna go through this the, the rabbit hole of having a standard formatting for the code and adding that to CI, we need to be very careful, because this is the, exactly the type of thing that Magetta will rent for days. So we need to be able to configure. Yeah. Actually, there's a pretty sane way of formatting code that does the right thing in most cases, which is actually something suggested by uh, Tonsky. Uh, he's a, he did a lot of closure tooling. Uh, and there's a link about it that basically talks about exactly that. The problem is that this kind of, this style of formatting that he suggests is a bit different from the traditional Lisp style, which means that it's actually not implemented anywhere. <laughs> okay. Um, is it, is it uh, this? Here. Wait, isn't what you, we want something like this? Or am I going crazy? Because this is a hidden file. Oh, I already read that that link that you sent there, but not about yeah. oh, yeah. but not about closure it, though. No, no, it does. Uh, yeah, Repo FMT does have a hidden file for configuration. The problem is that the actual syntax of the file is not really is not really documented. So. Oh, you're talking that we don't know what is written in here. Yeah, I looked into the the actual repo for the formatter where it's implemented. It yeah. does have its own formatting rules in a file, but as I said, it's just a bunch of definitions, and I'm not and okay, so, not clear what they actually mean. You know. Okay, so this guy here, this this name, this guy is a very active user in the Racket Discord server. So, uh, so I would say that maybe we have a shot. On going there? No, 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 so, no source code time. No, 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 no. We we purposely chose to not to choose a language that has docs and and tooling and stuff like that. Uh, because we we learn our lesson with Go and OCaml, and we're not gonna do we're not gonna do it again. Uh, so I think we could ask him the author himself to see if he if we don't have docs at all to understand how to configure the formatter. So that's an option. And and again, he's very active on Discord. He's very, very active. Um, that's only a suggestion, though. We can try to... I don't know. If, it, if it's not in the docs, uh, I don't know how the heck we're going to do it. Actually, the, the docs for the package specifically say that a lot of things are unstable. So... A lot of things. I remember that being a short section. I don't. I don't. I don't think a lot of things in the sense of a lot of things about uh, the implementation. Yeah, it actually works just fine. Um, it actually means about the configuring part of things. So yeah. Okay. So find a format for um, with custom that allows. Custom configuration. 
Yeah, so Nathan asked about examples on GitHub. The thing is, Rapid actually has a lot of formatters available, and I don't think the community settled on a standard one. So, yeah. No, but that's another thing that we can ask on Discord. Man, the, the Discord server, I, I actually, because this is being recorded, I should say this. I actually should have said this before. The Discord server of Rackets Discord server is awesome. Like they help people, they are very kind. Uh, they don't. They are definitely not fanboys of Racket. They understand uh, when people have other preferences. Uh, they are very concise in their explanations of stuff, and I, and they help a lot. So I think we can ask them. We can ask them about the what is the, what would be a a sense a reasonable formatter formatting tool. Uh, and they're yeah. probably gonna have a bunch of answers on that. Yeah, I don't think Racket is the kind of language that would pull in by fanboys in the first place. So, so no, but every single know. language, every single programming language runs the risk of having fanboys, because there's yeah. a lot of people that are that that I don't know. They they for some reason see a benefit in being a fanboy. So. Yeah, I do understand that. It's just that with Racket's uh, more academic backgrounds, that seems slightly less likely. Not impossible, just less likely. <laughs> just read what that then said. Oh boy. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, they do have an answer for that. They have typed Racket. You yeah, know? They, would, they would just say typed Racket. <laughs> Which implements a type system in using macros. Yeah. <clears throat> oh, this is the same guy. This is the same name. <laughs> uh, a lot of people attempted to implement it, but besides, I know none of them is finished. Traditionally, use identer instead of the formatter. Both Dr. Rect and Rector mode provide identer functionality. There is no CLI indenter, but you can write one easily using this. There is also pretty printing. But it's only to printing as expressions, uh, so it wouldn't work well with actual Racket code. Racket code. I created one. <laughs> like, this is superb. Thanks for sharing. Yeah, I, I'm gonna talk to this guy uh, on Discord to see to see if we, if he can if he can try to extract some configuration and stuff. Uh, there's this. There's also this one. So the question is, does this provide some sort of configuration file? That's so weird though, because like hlint, which is a very common Haskell linter, it allows us to configure a bunch of stuff. Um, like a bunch of stuff, like it's very granular, very, very granular. It formats the files, blah, 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 blah. And of course it's written in racket. Well, we can, I, the issue is already created. We, we just need to find the, uh, uh, just need to seek for answers. So let me actually edit this and say, um, the f one possible candidate candidate would be uh, this. What other issues can we add here? Uh, other issues, let's see. Yeah, right now uh, let's not put any issues related to uh, the actual board of stuff because I think a a every single to do here is gonna have like dozens of e e smaller issues related to it. Uh, yeah, okay. For That's instance, fine. I think we should focus on making this um, basic uh, basic binary serialization. Yeah, I think this would be the first thing to go to to do. Uh, because this is actually the easiest thing to do out of all of these, I, b I believe. Um, which is basically, in order to do the basic binary serialization, we need to have we need to define the model. So we're going to have to s choose between objects or structs. Uh, yeah. If you're going to have constraints is, or not. Yeah, and then everything else is built on top of that. So yeah, it's exactly. Kind of. Yeah. It's kind of the obvious place to start. Yeah, I think we actually I need to add an item here. So define no implement. Uh, um, how can how can I we describe that? What we want what we need to do is modeling. Um, modeling. 
I don't know. I don't know how to say that. But we need to define a model. Like, what's going to be the, the foundation? Um, what's going to be the foundation of everything else? Because there are some things that's going to be fixed. For instance, the schema is always going to be a hash map. The table fields is always going to be a hash map. But how are we going to represent fields? How are we going to represent tables? How are we going to represent types? How are we going to represent literals? Uh, and stuff like that. So we need we need to have that discussion uh, shortly, like immediately, because that's the mandatory requirement for all of these. What else? I would probably go with you know just drawing my two cents on the representation issue. I would probably go with um, my first instinct is to go with basic regex types, specifically the immutable ones, like immutable string, immutable bytes. Um, numbers are obviously immutable as well. Um, uh, when you say that you are doing immutable primitives, so how can you identify in racket code if something is mutable or immutable? Uh, I don't know if you did this distinction here. There is... Um, First of all, Racket pairs are immutable by default. So that whenever you see a list in Racket, they are immutable. That's okay. different from traditional scheme, which has mutable pairs by default. Um, yeah, that. That's a breaking change. Um, the other thing is any reader literal you see is also immutable because it's a literal in the source code and it will be confusing if you could mutate it while the program run, runs because it, would, it wouldn't match your expectation from just reading the code. So any literal you see in the code is also immutable. And um, for the most part, uh, the, 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 the built-in functions are pretty good about documenting whether they return mutable things or immutable things. I already um, noticed that mutable things have an exclamation mark. Yeah, uh, it's a, that's a scheme convention, actually. Um, whenever you mutate something, any destructive operation will have an exclamation mark. That's a, that's a convention inherited from scheme, so that helps. Okay, so we are definitely having a mix, a mix approach here, because a lot of things are using lists, but some things like these things uh, are definitely using mutation. And on, on, on last weekend, when I was making the implementation of the serialization of the schema, mm -hmm. My mind was so completely melted because I was like, it was what, 7 a.m. in the morning without sleeping that my, to do the operations, the, 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 like, how can I say the, the operations that I need to do, add some, to do some logic, the, that it, for my specific format that I decided to implement for the serialization of the schema, I actually made them mutable. So for instance, this thing here. Uh, so this function here, so fix empty read line, read, read uh, byte lines, it is completely based on mutation, completely based. So there's a bunch of exclamation marks, there's a bunch of imperative stuff. I noticed that. I was actually wondering why you didn't go with immutable data, uh, because that's actually the, the, the easier path on Racket. Uh, but if you were tired at the time, then for yeah. this specific algorithm, like because I'm not I'm not gonna explain it right now. But the situation was actually I will explain it right now because it's so freaking crazy. So in the in the middle of my testing, when I was looking at the the table programmer here, uh, yes. there is a byte in here that it, that is converted to ASCII uh, new line. Which means that I that it completely screwed over my logic of reading line by line because this byte would create a new line out of thin air, but it doesn't represent anything because it's just a byte randomly that by coincidence it is the new line in ASCII. So that means that I I had to be aware of these un unintentional new lines, and that's why I created this function. This function, the whole purpose of it, is to filter not to filter but to put new lines um in the correct place to not then to, to not allow them to be isolated because if you have a, a random uh, new line in the middle of this list we're gonna have one guy that is empty it's just the new line but that is wrong because it, it is impossible uh, to have a new line empty in the format that i created 
It, it is not possible to do that. So I know for a fact that every single time that something is um, is empty, that means that this is an unintentional new line created by coincidence. So this function, the whole purpose of this function uh, is to... Uh, I, I didn't read binary as text, by the way, uh, Nathan. I actually, I reckon it has a function called... Um, byte lines? I really don't remember. Yeah, no, the function is considering, is reading binary, but it detects when you have a new line. And when it uh, at 7 a.m. in the morning, my idea was, okay, I just need to grab the lines. And then I discovered this bug. And, and by the way, it took me a while to discover that. Because it was not clear to me when I was looking at the serialized data. How the heck there's an empty line in the file? How? That shouldn't be possible. But then I asked to look to the, in the, to the file using um, X, X, Excel. I think it's the mode in Emacs. That, that shows the data as as raw as it possible. And then I saw that, oh, this byte here is, is in ASCII N. Oh my God. Uh, that, that, that was so a coincidence, but, coincidence, but it, I was, I, I'm glad it, it, it happened because that um, made me fi may, may, may make a function to actually count for that. And I didn't manage to create a, a way to do that in, in, immu in an immutable way. For me, it was like, this is so easy using mutation. Um, and because this is only a local mutation, I'm going to do it. <sighs> but anyway, uh -huh. that's the whole explanation of this guy. So, yeah, I was wondering about that. Because <laughs> Racket does actually have uh, immutable hashes. And in fact, they are easier to use than the mutable ones because you can just call a function named hash and that returns the, the, the an immutable hash with the keys and values that you pass to it. So Yeah, but this is not a hash. This is a list, this guy. Yeah, list. Um, lists also... The thing about lists is that, as I said, um, racket lists are immutable. Yeah. But the variables that, that refer to the list they can be mutated fairly easily, actually, because if you if you you can just throw a set bang somewhere, and that that so you know. Um, I wouldn't actually recommend it uh, because I'm more of a functional programming kind of guy. No, but if we but use these, we're not going to have to care. Yeah. 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 This and, was only for for like, again 7 a.m. melted brain. Uh... And uh, I, the only reason I did this is because I was so freaking close to, to have it done. And I was, man, I'm not going to sleep until this is done. Uh, and uh, and I, st I think I, 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 it took me like seven hours in total because I had to learn how to use the define parse syntax rule stuff. And I have to create all the logic, all this logic that is in I.O. here. Um, this also t took me a, a little while, this, this guy here. I was like, yeah. how the heck am I going to do this? And then I, and then I discovered that there is curry. This function here is cool. Uh, yeah, Racket has curry and curry R, and they are awesome. They are way better than Closure's Partial. Oh, yeah. They are better than Closure's Partial. That's true. Oh, freaking yeah. So, uh, yeah, it took me a while to do this. And I also fixed this function here. This function read the table values from this. This was wrong. And I also fixed that before I slept. But anyway, so I agree that we should try to not use mutation. And if we have to use mutation, only local mutation. So then we can maintain the referential transparency. Yeah. Um, the the one thing you were talking about with specifically with the dereference things, uh, the reference no, this realization uh, about. Uh, I, I noticed the, the, the defined serializable macro you wrote, yeah. and it put some mutation in there, which, I yeah. mean, you're registering a thing so in a, in a registry, essentially, yeah. so yeah. you, you, you kind of have to do that. Um, one thing that concerns me is about name collisions. How are you dealing with that? I'm not dealing with that at all. <laughs> That's actually an awesome point. 
if you want to read the, read the final procedure that has like a procedure class in here and you want to use the same name you're gonna just override the previous one and that's it but I thought that wouldn't be a problem at all because nobody ever is gonna do that because the only people touching this code are the ones making the database which is us uh, so we're never so, gonna make two tables for instance a table is only one entity a procedure is an entity as well okay yeah I, I suppose that's fair that's fair we can deal with that um, right oh and, and let me explain why actually and I, I, now for you I think it's important to explain because you know more than lisps than us so when I asked the racket server about this problem before my original intention was actually to grab the names of stuff. Yeah. To grab the names of the stuff in here. And then do an evolve using an, a, a new object out of thin air. Okay. So I would evolve this guy to actually a name, like a, a, a keyword in Racket, and do a new object of this keyword. So I would create an, a procedure, an object of a procedure, and I would fulfill the contents of that object with the data afterwards. Racket people made me change my mind, and they and they actually suggested to have, if you have a hash map that saves the name with the actual class, um, uh, you you have you don't have to do an evolve because apparently. Um, and I already heard this from multiple, uh, from more than one Lisper. Commander also said that, I believe. That if you want to do an evolve, think twice. Think twice. So they actually recommended yeah. me They actually recommended me to save stuff. But then I counter argued then saying that, oh, but what happens if I want to create a new stuff? I'm going to have to remember to go to that hash map and do another set. And then they said, just do a macro. A macro that does both. Every single time you create one, you automatically insert it. And then I said, okay, <laughs> you won. Uh, so then that's why I made yeah. this thing. Yeah, my, my position on that is, um, unless you are writing kernel, and by kernel I mean John Schutz kernel language, which is uh, an academic Lisp dialect. Unless you're doing that, then you should definitely avoid evil. Yeah. Yeah. Um, they they told me to avoid a vol at all costs. They told me that. Uh, but then uh, and then they suggested me to do a macro that will both define and insert for me because I I would forget. Uh, I would forget to do this every single time. Yeah, that's that's a reasonable that's a reasonable use case for defining a macro because um, if you could I mean. You could technically use a function, but then you would have to quote stuff and you would oh, have yeah. to remember to quote stuff. Exactly. So, yeah. You're going to no, have to no, quote just, it. No, just use a macro. Just use a macro and be done with it. Yeah. But again, so for instance, let's suppose that we transform all this, all the classes to structs. Uh, yeah. I, I don't actually know how we're going to map those to this. We're going to have to think on how to make that bridge happen. But if it requires some mechanism that we're going to read what, the, what, what is the name of the struct in the file to, to know how to deserialize properly, we can use the same mechanism that I made it here. But instead of classes, it's going to be structs. Yeah, you totally can. Uh, it's just uh, for struct specifically, uh, since this map, this hash map is being used specifically for deserializing, you probably only need the the structure type descriptor, which ah, okay, is defined. Cool. Yeah, you don't need you, because you see the struct form in Racket is actually defines a bunch of stuff at the same time. It defines the constructor, it defines a predicate, it defines all the accessors for the fields, and it defines the, the type descriptor, which is uh, struct, colon, and then the name you, you chose. So yeah, for reading specifically, this era, uh, for deserializing, we just need the, 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 the type descriptor because... That's cool. Actually, yeah, I actually tested this out on the repo uh, yesterday. And apparently you can, in fact, call a generic function with the type descriptor instead of the struct. Uh, and that works. So, Okay. Uh, so which is which is which is actually great because when you're deserializing, you don't you don't have the the thing yet 
So yeah. the TypeScript is a good standing for that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I, I, I think I got it, and that's cool. That's pretty cool. Okay, so, uh, but let's actually try the, why we are here and not, not, Nagita is having dinner. Let's try to define what would be the trade-offs here, because I, because I, st I'm still not convinced, and I want to, you to try to clarify that to me. So, we have some constraints here, right? So, for instance, we have a literal, and what is a literal? Literal is something that represents literal data so this is not like an abstraction to the in the model this is actually data itself that you're gonna write like the table person's gonna have the name and the surname the your name yeah. marinho and your surname or something else is gonna be literals both of those right yes so as you can see here there are some things that the literal super class is doing that all the others the, the all the other literals are already gaining it for free so uh, this sort of relation, right? So another relation that we have down here that would be nice to have is to have like something called an entity. And then we can say that a table is an entity and a procedure is an entity and everything else and everything that applies to an entity applies to both of those. So in other languages, we would do an ADT for that, right? We would do yeah. that in F sharp, we would do that in OCaml, we would do that in Haskell, which is what we did. If you go back to the original uh, archived project, which is called Camelot, which is here. Camelot. <laughs> That's actually a cool name for an OCaml project. Uh, and, and actually, if you search Camelot on Google, it's gonna the Wikipedia page is about something like castles, and your database is the foundation of the project, right? So that's why I chose we chose this name. I proposed this name, and Magita agreed. Yeah, Camelot is the name of King Arthur's castle in British uh, yeah. legend. Yeah, so that's uh, that, that's the foundation of the... And I actually, when I was brainstorming the logo, it would be like a tower and or and, and something like that and stuff like that. Anyway, but anyway, the, the thing is, we make a... Re we did that in here. So we have... Uh, this is the literals that we have in Racket we have here in Rocamel. And we are saying that both the v integer and the v string they are both literals, and the same applies to like oh you have a type both t thirty integer thirty two and t strings they are both types. So I want to know how you would do uh, how would you do these sort of constraints between um, structs? How would that happen? How how would you do that? And yes, we can just YOLO it and not don't have don't have these sort of constraints. But I would like to try to pursue the ideal scenario. Yeah. So first of all, uh, ADTs in dynamic languages are kind of not a thing because you know you have predicates that can differentiate between values of each type. No, but I'm fine with that. Can... I'm not asking for ADTs. Yeah, yeah, I'm fine. Yeah. I'm fine. I'm, I just so, want to know, is there any mechanism to replicate this type of constraint with structs? There is. In fact, if you want to be, if you want to be really um, literal about things, if you forgive the pun, uh, there is actually inheritance between structs. It's not, it's not very common because the way it's, it works is that you define a struct super type and it has its fields and the methods in the generic in methods in, it defines, so that's that. And then if you try to define a subtype, what you're actually saying is this struct has all the fields of the other structs in the same order. And then also these ones tacked on at the end. Um, you see what I mean? Yeah, it's I see what you of, mean. I totally see yeah, what you mean. It's, yeah, it's kind of a positional thing. It's not really based on, on yeah, names. Yeah, it seems to be structural quality, names. right? Yeah, so the way I would do it is I would define a struct for each type, sure. uh, for each class you have. Sure. And then if I wanted to, to, to only allow certain kinds of structs to be used as arguments for the constructors, I would, I would use, I would probably use a guard if there was uh, some kind of complex logic uh, or pre-processing that you have to do. And I would probably put each struct in its own module. And when exporting the struct out of the module, 
you can put a contract around the constructor so that it only accepts values that satisfy a predicate. And it could actually be a, a, any kind of contract, but predicates are the simplest kind of contract. And then if you really want to, to be fancy, you could define a, a dummy generic interface called entity. And then when you have a when in your serializable interface, you could declare that any serializable value also automatically derives the entity interface. And then you could use the predicate from the entity interface as your contract. And it should work more or less automatically as you define each struct and and the serialized interface methods for okay, each I, th I think type. I got it. I think I got it. Um, I, I think I got what you said. That's what I mean. Um, now yeah. I get to your back. Yeah. Okay, so let me tell you what we did. We discussed about creating new issues, and the mm -hmm. only one that we pro uh, we speculated is to find a formatter. Oh, uh, one thing. Yeah. So I was going to say you know, formatter like the to format the code actually, yeah. right? Yeah. I mean, not yeah. the binary. Uh, okay. And then uh, 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 the, the formatter that it is in that is in the documentation, which is this one. This guy mm -hmm. is very active in the Discord server. <laughs> this guy. Okay. Oh, is he from uh, uh, Thailand? The I have no idea. Tiny. I have absolutely yeah. no idea. The name looks Thai. Anyway, uh, so we did, we discussed about that, and now I was I, I asked uh, Maria. What I, I wanted working it was like an LSP so you can complete stuff what do you mean no you're talking like about a, formatter not LSP yes I know I wanted something like an LSP like a so and, can... and Racket does have an LSP actually yeah so here's the the thing we tried to use that with Emacs and the uh, VS Code and none of those none of the two I think worked well are you sure I remember yeah. LSP working on me in my Emacs. Yeah, but man, yeah. it doesn't the, give you complete, yeah. it doesn't give yeah. you like it shows like some stuff, but it doesn't give you um Oh the like hover the, stuff? Yeah, like hovering ah. in some box. Like that kind of stuff. Oh okay, okay. So he's know. talking about the what we have in closure in VS Code uh, Marine. Oh cool. Or in your your editor. I, didn't I remember see. that you use you, you you use a very fancy editor as well. Um, yeah, not said static like uh, I mean I don't think it is static no it's not static at all dynamic, because the, man that, even yeah. like uh, okay I know the common LSP is not an LSP that is just his line but it has docs right I just wanted something that shows yeah, yeah, the docs it, yeah closure has it it's not static yes. closure has it no oh, javascript yeah, yeah go on Marie. go on sorry sorry yeah about um, two things first about the LSP Racket does have an LSP but actually, it's based on Dr. Racket's APIs, and Dr. Racket only works on individual files. It doesn't actually do whole project uh, oh. stuff. Well, but then so... it's silly. What are you guys doing? <laughs> <laughs> you can still program everything in one file, right? Like, that's what Nathan does. Fortran times. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and... And the other thing is that um, you do have hover on the Racket LSP, but it actually it actually kind of cheats because the documentation it shows you is actually from the Racket documentation. No, 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 no. But and Mageta I'm hates not... to go to the browser, Marty. Yes, yes. My my no. My my own problem is that it kills the fast feedback loop that you have in Lisp, right? Uh, yeah, you need to keep browsing. Like the documentation on the browser is like often. I, I just wanted something that quickly gives me a, a guideline on what to do. Yeah, and, uh, and, and let me let me make it more clear, Marin, because I think it's important. It's 100. It's high percentage of important to make my Geta more productive. This really matters I, for him. Really matters. What? <laughs> He I really think. likes LSP and the quick feedback loop and stuff. And every single time we need to open the browser, he, he cringes every single time. Yes. So, I, so I yeah, the thing is, the thing is, uh, the the LSP does kind of cheat by using the 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 docs from Racket itself, which obviously there's 
they are compared to HTML, so yeah. Mm -hmm. But it does in fact show the, the docs inline in my editor, so I don't see why it shouldn't work on any other editors, editor since that's kind of the point of an LSP, so... Okay, so l l after this call, l after we finish the quote-unquote design meeting, I can go with my Git and Emacs and we can, we can try to debug that. That's fine. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so let's go let back to my explanation here. So, here. Margaret, I was explaining to to Marin the the whole um, what 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 are we using in the object system uh, and stuff like that, what we value, what we want to have, and stuff like that. And then I asked him, can we do the same with structs? Because mm -hmm. the main point, the main argument that he has is that structs are immutable by default, which is I think we all agree that's better. Um, and we are using some mutability here. So, for instance, these guys are mutation. It's local mutation, but it, it is mutation. Um, and then one of the main points, for me at least, that we have with the object system is that we can enforce some constraints between the classes, which is not something that I am aware structs can do in the general sense. Then Marinho said that it is possible to, uh, to do the, such constraints with structs, although it is uncommon. And he would actually do something that reminds me a lot of Python, which is that you have a function that when you receive your arguments, you first check some predicates before executing the actual functionality. So that would be checking if an entity function, for instance, if the struct that you receive needs to be a table or a procedure, or otherwise you're going to crash, right? Yeah, that's, that could be done uh, in two places, actually. There's the, the guard uh, procedure for the actual struct type, which allows you to apply arbitrary logic and transformations to the, the value you're trying to pass to the constructor before calling the constructor. Yeah. And, but the more common thing to do is actually to just wrap the, the, the constructor in a contract when you export it to the other modules. And then in the yeah, contracts, and, you will. Yeah, you and there's also that, this other abstraction yeah. that he called, that he said is contracts, which I'm not aware of. But uh, so that's what we discussed. Why you, why you, you, you have, you have a dinner. So this yeah. is just to redo all of this. That's what the discussion yeah. basically. Yeah, Racket's contract system is is really great. Um, it's not something I've seen in other languages. Uh, I'm pretty sure there are other languages that have this stuff, but they are not very commonly used. I think one of them is AFO, actually. <laughs> AFO? <laughs> yeah, I mean, the AFO <laughs> tower. There's a language with that name. Yeah. No, 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 no. We are not, we are not, I'm not, we are not laughing because yeah, of the name. He doesn't know the lore. <laughs> yeah, he doesn't know the <laughs> So oh, let, let me give you a, a summary. So there is a chat up there, because you're a developer, you can see. There is a, mm -hmm. a chat there called Project Decision, right? Yeah. And there is a pin message on that chat, which is the list of languages that we consider to do projects in. Right? Yeah. Apple <laughs> is there. Oh. <laughs> no, I really wanted to do something on it, but uh, because I think it, it defines a lot of the initial role of uh, uh, that you have like in small talk, the class. Uh, but I, I, I've always been scared of it. So that's yeah, yeah, I, because that's the thing. Uh, I think that with these very, very esoteric languages, we need to do a project that is not like not hard. <laughs> yeah, that doesn't require a lot of third-party support. Okay, so yeah, if like you have to do stuff by hand, it, it can be you hellish. You have to rely on this project here. Look at, look at the amazing project. <laughs> Liberty fell from Gimbal and stuff. Uh, so, the like, there are a bunch of languages that, that that suffers from this. Like, we already considered doing a for for a uh, fourth, uh, a small talk. All of these languages yeah. we already considered oh, doing projects in. But uh, we always ask ourselves, like, for this specific project, are we are we gonna have to have great support from the outside world? Because if the answer is yes, often the answer is no. <laughs> because for instance, the, the the LFA project, there was basically no support at all, and it was Man, a bunch was of pain. guessing. I don't know how we did that. That was really pain, somehow. <laughs> yeah, but we did it. We did it. 
so we try to avoid, like we try to contain our enthusiasm based on how complicated the project is. So for instance, we would never do the, the database project in April. Never, ever. <laughs> Uh, well, Racket kind of has AFO's most compelling features, so I don't think you're missing out on that. <laughs> yeah, but you are aware of that. We were, we weren't. That's the difference. I uh, see. So uh, most of the time, to be fair, it's not really about the feature, the language, because more or less, more most of the time, it's like some languages don't offer that much, right? No, 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 but uh, you can deny that, Magita. Every single time that you need to do something that is very extensive, not hard, but extensive, both you and you, both you oh, and no, me, yes, we complain, we complain a lot. That's true, but when I, my point is, uh, I think it's more tied to the desire to do something different, you know, yeah. like to just explore the Terra incognito. Yeah, we, 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 we have our biases, we have our preferences, but we, we are open-minded to try to, 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 to see what's out there. Because one of the main problems that we had in the beginning is that every single time we suggested a language that, is, that was not functional programming, Maget would say no. Then... Oh, man, dude. Yeah, the <laughs> I convinced... was even there, like, what? Well, there's yeah. a lot of options in that, in that no, no, comment. No, no, that's a false accusation, man. No, like, man. I agree more with a lot of, like, non-functional... No, 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 but I remember that, that we had this, this discussion before, Maget. You can't deny that. We have the discussion that we you and I, we uh, we have biases towards some stuff, and if we if we want to accomplish the one of the one of the focus of having the sessions, we would have to op be more open-minded and do stuff that we don't necessarily see as the best approach to do it. So, oh, for instance, we did JavaScript only... once. Do you remember that? No. Okay, <laughs> but it's it is because of okay, JavaScript is a exception but <laughs> i don't have a i don't have a problem with like <laughs> that's because you put it in a way that that Magetta will will likely agree with javascript hmm. uh, is terrible but it gets a pass because it originally was meant to be a scheme dialect so it was supposed to be a list oh, man, it, it wasn't man, because i have a picture i share with benevides every monday let me find it here yeah, but we we know that JavaScript was was supposed to be the lisp of the web, but that's not how things turn out. Well, it does have first class functions and had them for a really long time, actually. So that puts uh, it ahead of is, a lot the of languages. Is not the features. That's what I'm saying. Is the look of the language the most of the time? Like uh, you look at JavaScript and you. See and oh yeah, just, yeah. That's like, another. That's another. That's another quirk of Magetta Marin for you to learn. He cares a lot about syntax, man. A lot. I care. I actually, I care more about the syntax of the language than the language. <laughs> I think. I'm willing to take the the semantics, the weirdness, like all these parts. Like the syntax, it just makes it like dull most of the time. And I, I already told Magetta that I agree that syntax is important, but I don't understand his being his primary criteria. I don't. I don't get that. It just makes it boring, man. Like oh, uh, yeah. Lemus. Go on, uh, Just to say something. We are just so far behind, man. Like, really, really, really. Saw is left Nutella, man. Because <laughs> something was happening called Hinge Back End. <laughs> what? And oh, I know. I knew about yeah, that all, all was, the way through. So, so yeah. Basically, a challenge. So, you make an API to do some benchmarking and stuff. And Gabi and Sophia, they did the, the challenge in, in Lean, Lean 4. And they did all the info. Like, yeah, the I know. They, they were the... shared on LinkedIn. Even if you heard about the Hingman. <laughs> <Hingeman. laughs> no, but, but, but my point is if the language doesn't have shit, you should make that shit. Is no, it? that's okay, but that's not that, but that's not the point that we were discussing. I'm just uh, I'm just telling Marim to get my, to get to know Magita better. That's what I'm saying. I'm not what I'm doing. No, I mean like we're it's saying before, crazy. like oh, I would never do the project in that language because it doesn't have shit. So well, <laughs> you can do the shit, right? Someone has to do it. No, no, no. But that's that's the trade-off. You gotta you gotta pick if you really want. Like, how hard do you want to do a project in a language if you're going to have to do a very, 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 very extensive thing by, your, by yourself? Right? So, um, 
Uh, I don't know. I don't know if you if you pick to do everything by yourself. You're a Chad. Maybe you're just wasting your time. Because doing it, you're not gonna learn everything. Anything. You're just gonna spend time. I don't know. It's very yeah, hard to tell. Just, yeah, just about that kind of thinking in general. Um, if you think about not doing everything yourself, and you try to make trade-offs on that side. Chances are you will never, ever, ever use Forp. Ever. No, but that's the thing. We are aware that some languages require more effort than others. The problem yeah, is that we need a balance they, between... Just one, just one thing here. They really did implement the Postgres protocol in C++ for Lean. Oh, that's you're you're really... checking the GitHub? Yes, dude. The, we, I mean, this is really cool. I wish I could have done this on... SML. Yeah, I, no. I would say that you do, you shouldn't compare yourself in any regard to Sofia. No, no, like, I'm just thinking, man, this is cool. They did a lot of uh, like, and to be fair, like a lot of the stuff they did here, I saw, like for example, this uh P PGC uh, for uh, Lean. Uh, I'll send the link here. This is not hard at all, man. Like this is very easy. They just did a look at the, the, the REPL I sent. Like, I'm just, just thinking here. We could... <clears throat> oh, okay. I'm not trying to devirtuate. Virtuate? Is that a word? I have uh, no to, idea. The focus from the... Like, to deviate, I think. Yes. Deviate is a word. I know yeah, that. Yeah, deviate the focus from the database project. But I really do think that we should pick more closed projects like this. What do you mean by closed projects? Man, this is like a week of work. Um, like a database is like a year. <laughs> so that's well, but that's that's, that's part of the fun. Is the fact no, that it takes a while. I know, but what I'm saying is like, I part of the reason why I mostly burned like uh, going with like stupid languages like Z. I'll like what? Zig, you know? Like Zig. Uh, a stupid, uh, stupid. Not, not <laughs> saying that it, Zig is stupid, uh, it's just my way to speak. Yeah, no, that's, that's another, another quirk of Mageta. Mageta says a lot everything. of curses uh, terms, but he in, uh, most of the time he doesn't actually mean it. Yeah, it's just... Uh, uh, but the thing that sucks is that he does that, that by text as well, and then it sucks a lot <laughs> more. Uh, just a <laughs> anyway, uh, Like, I really... We could do... More projects in a rotati rot rotative, rotative manner. Doing like more close the scope, like doing an HTTP server, which is also not that like uh, hard. If you yeah, have, I'm gonna uh, let, actually let me interrupt you just a little bit because I want to finish the recording with Racket Tower. Then I we can go on with the, the discussion because I have things yeah, to yeah, talk okay, about okay. that. Anyway, so I would say, uh, Magita, that we only have two possible options. Or we stop everything that we are doing and focus on, do, and on the basic binarization. In order to do that, we're going to have to decide which modeling we're going to use. Right now, we have this one. We have some problems with it. We have a suggestion of a change. Mm -hmm. I think we could uh, swap this. And there's also another thing that we could do that we can do in parallel mm -hmm. with that, which is to finish the parser of the language. We can you don't you don't need to have that ready uh, with the modeling. You can do actually the parser be, uh, isolated. What you're gonna do is the following: you're gonna go here, and then you're gonna define all of this crap, and then in here you're just gonna return I don't know new or I don't know a symbol, whatever. But you're gonna do all the grammar and all the parsing. This can be done in parallel. And that reminds me that we also need to define what the heck is going to be the the, exp the the modeling of the language, right? Because, for instance, how the heck are we going to model this? We're going to have to have an expression here, which means that we're going to have to have an evolve, like uh, an evolve like we did in the silverware. Um, so you're also going to have to design that, because this is like Mageta Kiel, that's okay. But what is this? Why did it here inherit my name? I no, because because, I because you coin it. I'm just reusing it. Okay. Uh, so I, I I actually we didn't think of that when we were doing the parser the first time because we focus on this one. 
Mm -hmm. But now that I, when I was parsing this, I said to myself, wait, this is going to be an expression that needs to be evaluated. But we don't have that notion here. We don't have a notion of an expression. Uh, an expression in the sense of a programming language, per se, just like we did in Silver again. So this is another point of discussion. How the heck are we going to model this? I thought, and I don't know if that's a good idea, I thought on trying to transform this to functions, like racket functions, and, and then you write in quote the function. Instead of having to go all the way down to like the rabbit hole of making an expression, blah, blah, blah. We can just assume that this is all, always going to have to be a boolean, like a predicate, something that always returns a boolean. And then we can try to make some sort of like quote. Uh, oh, I can type in here, but it's going to be like quote uh, fn. Or no, this is this is not uh, this, this is not fn. This is not f sharp. So lambda. And then we do some sort of we pick the variables. We pick the variables and we put as parameters with macros mm. and stuff like that. So we try to, it's basically a gambiarra, like a hack, to, to try to avoid doing it properly. Because to do it properly, I don't know how we're going to do it, because I don't know the best way to do it in, in, in our case. Just define a struct name, named expression, make it implement an eval interface, and then and, and start from there. Okay. I actually, yeah, I actually kind of, I actually kind of have a bit of experience on this because back way before my pet project Sal was even named Sal, actually before it even was what it is now, um, I was studying Schutz kernel language, which I already mentioned, um, and I was actually trying to implement an evaluator for a dialect of that language in Racket, and at the time. Um, I used, I just defined a bunch of structs for the things I needed as primitives as, you know, I didn't have to define a struct for the pair type because I just used uh, rackets pair, but I used structs and, and I defined interfaces for that. Um, I think yeah. it's the most natural way to do it in rackets is that. Yeah. Um, I sense. personally, yeah, I personally wouldn't use the, the object system myself. I'm pretty sure it was developed first as a kind of... Um, I'm pretty sure the object system was originally developed um, as an academic exercise that was then used as a, you know, classroom material for to teach people about OO without having to leave racket. And then they used it for the, the GUI of Dr. Racket, but I don't think it's that widely used outside of GUI stuff. No, that's okay. I'm not. I'm not preaching to you continue using the object system anyway. I just want. Uh, if you have, if we can make the constraints happen, for me it's fine to use immutability and all that stuff. But anyway, yeah. Magetta, that's the entire scenario. So you can do this in parallel. Finish the grammar, remove ambiguity because this is still. A, this is still yeah. has ambiguity. This this parser here. Yeah. And then in the meantime, um, we do an extraordinary <laughs> effort to to fix this. Go on, Marie. Yeah, about the parser, um, I haven't looked at looked at it yet, um, but uh, I have one question actually. Why did it not start with a peg grammar? Because peg grammars are not ambiguous and they cannot be ambiguous, so you kind of have skipped that problem altogether if you do that. I think the reason is because the first link that we searched on record documentation was to use a lexer, which is uh, which is this guy, this guy, and then the the follow up on the record documentation was to use the lexer in the parser. So that's that was the whole rationale. We didn't uh, we didn't pick this specific approach for any particular reason. I see, I see. I suppose that makes sense. Um, I see. The thing is, I like peg grammars in general because they are easier to reason about with regards to how they actually execute. Uh, it's one reason, actually, why I really like LPEG, the Lua library, LPEG. Um, I've heard of it. 
yeah, it's really good. It's really cool. There, the the paper about it is very interesting as well. Um, but personally, I you probably start with um, I my thing is actually to work out the pattern by hand. But then if it gets too complicated, I'll probably move to a background instead because it's I think... really close to how you. Wait, Mario, wait, wait, wait. I think better. I think we got the message, but your it's, microphone is is your internet is oscillating again. Uh, yeah, okay, just try something. Anyway, that's the plan, so we gotta have to decide that. So Maget, Maget, what do you think? What do you think we should do? Maget, are you there? Uh, sorry, I was talking. Okay, so that's the situation. We have, we can do the two things in parallel, which is to redo everything uh, using structs and stuff like that. And we also can make the parser using uh, what Marin just said that apparently removes uh, removes ambiguity by construction. Uh, I have a link here. One moment. Here. Yeah. Yeah, Nathan. Very great. I do like recursive descent. I, the thing about PEGS is that it's basically a formalization of recursive descent. So that's why there's no ambiguity. So, yeah. It's also why I like it. Because, you know. Okay. Okay, so I think... Um... We can try to do those two things in parallel, um, and I, I think that's the. If if nobody has anything else to say, I'm gonna finish the recording. Yeah, just do. I I will do the. On my free time, I'll start working on the. To be honest, I will try to make it. Up. And it cuts your microphone. It's gonna try to make what? Oh, I'll I'll make it ahead of. For this session, so we don't have to waste time on the. Okay. Notes. And.